Julian, I have focused on the laws of nature, the laws of physics, as the place to really assess the physical world and really how it works. But, but actually, there's a more fundamental question of how you can get to the bedrock of science. How, how would you get there? My way is, I think, as all scientists do, from you, you start with your own experiences and your intuitions, and you try and find the things that you think are most important to put into those laws. And all of my work really has been about taking out clutter and things that don't really belong there that were put in for a variety of reasons, and actually very good reasons, uh, starting with, with Newton's idea that there's a completely uniform absolute space in which things happen and that there's time flowing on without anything happening. Which is a common perception. It is, it is a common perception, but when you look at it and, and really try and reproduce actually what Newton did, you find that you can get rid of a great deal of that. Now, with my collaborators, what we are finding now is that actually we can reproduce everything that Newton and pretty well everything that Einstein did with assuming much less out there in the world than they put in. Mm. And, and the key things that, uh, that we can get rid of is any notion of time as, as fundamental. Uh, we don't need this. We are able to derive it from the, the laws that govern how things change, how the shape of the universe changes. And there isn't any length of time between this one that's before it's happened Time is measured by how different one state of the universe is, one configuration of the universe is from the one that came before. Now, even more dramatically, we find that we can get rid of distance altogether. It seems we can, we can develop Einstein's theory and get rid of distance as a fundamental concept, and all we need is angles. Now, I, I want to say something about angles because I really do think that angles are the bedrock of science or the, the something in the world that enables angles to be measured and be meaningful. Uh, let me just first make the observation that when we open our eyes, what we actually see are angles. Hmm. And distance is something that we've learned to uh, interpolate and to put into it from the experiences we've had. But, but superficially, you could have a, the same angle being close to you or very far away, I mean. But the angle, the further I take it away, my fingers look smaller as I move them away, but yes. the angle doesn't change. Right. That's very fundamental. Right. Let me also say that the discovery of the laws of planetary motion by Kepler 400 years ago, speaking in normal terms, was probably the single most important event that made possible Newton's discoveries in the whole scientific age. Mm -hmm. Now, that was the outcome of a process which had lasted about 2,000 years from when the Babylonians and the Greeks started making observations. And every single input that went into that was a measurement of angles. Yes. Yes. The astronomers essentially look at the position of the Big Dipper in the sky, and an, a practiced astronomer can tell that the time, the sidereal time of the stars to five minutes just by glancing at mm, the heavens. Mm. And then you can just make a very simple device which enables you to measure the angles between a planet and the nearest star to it. And everything was deduced from those angles. And what we're finding in, in our work is that we can do everything with angles and curves between angles. So, so all we need to have is the angle where those curves meet. Okay, but you, but you have curves. You have something that, that gives you a sense of, of distance. Uh, are, are, you, are you doing the same thing by just calling it by different names? No. I mean, you can... Uh, what we... Uh, actually, what happens is if you were to paint curves on the sky and you were to move with increasing speed, and, and you had some dots on the sky as well, it follows from Einstein's general theory of relativity. As, as, as you move through space, everything seems to move forward in the direction you're going, mm -hmm. but the angles at which curves meet do not change. Mm -hmm. that, that's something that is absolutely invariant and is rock solid. So that's what makes me think that that's absolutely what has to go into to nature to describe uh, reality. Okay, well, let me ask this then. You have now famously uh, ended time 
and now you're telling me you're getting rid of distance. So one, what do you have left? Uh, secondly, more importantly, is what does that tell us about the fundamental nature of reality? Well, first of all, I, I, I didn't say time has ended. I said it doesn't exist. <laughs> I don't want to, people to think Armageddon is coming. Uh, I, I certainly, if, if I assume that the external world is real, and as a working scientist I do, then I, I believe that, that it's something a bit like spaghetti out there in the world, and the angles at which the pieces of spaghetti meet, that's real. <laughs> but you can, so to speak, stretch the spaghetti without actually changing any physical... That, that's in our imagination that we, that, that mm. we stretch things about, mm. and, and, and that isn't an essential part of reality. Uh, so that there is something out there that is varied. There must be structure out in the world. And in fact, we call our theory now shape dynamics. Mm. Think of a triangle. A triangle is, has a size, as we think of it, and it also has a shape. Mm -hmm. But the shape is clearly much more fundamental mm -hmm. than the size. True. That, because the size depends upon the unit you've chosen arbitrarily to say how big it is. So I believe that ex explanation in science always relies upon shape and comparisons of shapes. And, and really, I think that what is happening is there's a competition between shapes. The, the, there are, there, there's a sort of a, there's a comparison going on somehow or other in, in nature or in, if you like, possibly in the mind of God, which is comparing shapes and saying, this is actually, a, if you like, a nicer shape than another one. And, and certainly shapes play a crucial role in all sorts of things. I mean, think of the immune system. It depends upon shapes sure, sure. in the body, uh, molecules attacking uh, viruses that have come in. So you have uh, shapes in terms of structure, and you have uh, static pictures of the world instead of our traditional sense of a flow of time. And do those two things make, make reality? The minimum that I think is needed to describe the world is shapes, different shapes. The universe can have different possible shapes. And I think that the quantum mechanics of the world is completely static. It just determines which shape is in some senses better than another, <laughs> should have a higher probability. And it has an incredible ability to select incredibly richly structured shapes, exactly like the one where we find ourselves now in this beautiful library in Copenhagen. <laughs>